When I started out doing wildlife photography, the thing that would frustrate me most was being out in nature, taking images, only to find out in reviewing that focus was slightly missed or even completely. For me, my journey to becoming a completely manual focused shooter in wildlife photography wasn't an easy one nor an overnight one, but it was one that I look back on and appreciate so much now. And I think I've benefited from exponentially. So today I'm gonna to be sharing one of my most requested topics, how I do manual focus in wildlife photography. Hey you guys, what's up? Hope you're doing well. So here it is, here's the video that I'm making on how I do manual focus in wildlife photography, the updated version. It's probably by far the most asked question that I get in terms of my wildlife photography and how I do it. I think because not many people do this in wildlife photography, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about my reasoning why I do this. Um, I'm gonna also talk about some core concepts that I think are important for you guys to understand before getting into the actual strategies of how I do it. And lastly, we're gonna be talking about how I practice these things, actually how I implement these things and get good at them. So to start out, I have three core concepts for you guys to understand. The first one being pre-focusing. So what pre-focusing is, is pre-focusing is this idea that I've named that, um, in which I will um, set focus to a subject before it ever moves into that focus point. So as an example, maybe you have two different perches, right? And you have a bird flying from one perch to another. I know that this bird is gonna take this path, take this route, and so what I'll do is I'll set my focus with my focus, uh, my focus ring. I'll set my focus to a certain spot, maybe in the middle where the bird's gonna be flying to capture him in flight. Maybe it's gonna be at the second perch, something like that. And I will set my focus there to be ready for when that bird crosses that plane of field. When that bird crosses that plane of field, I'll burst a bunch of pictures with my camera, and then suddenly I'll be able to capture a picture there. So that's what pre-focusing is. Now, a uh, second type of focusing, or a second type of concept, I should say, that I use a lot is pulling focus. What I mean by that is not necessarily like pulling focus in the way that I guess the, the normal turn means, but I, I kind of mean a specific version of that in which, let's say for example, that you have an animal running towards you across the frame and it's really unexpected and kind of on a whim. What I'll do in those scenarios is I'll pull focus, where I'll just very lightning quick almost, be pulling focus just in one direction, backwards or forwards, and as I'm doing that, I'll be snapping my mechanical shutter um, as much as I can as it's going boom, 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 boom. It's taking a bunch of shots as that focus is being pulled quickly back one direction. So that way, I'll usually wind up with one or two images that are in focus or close enough in focus to be able to use as I'm pulling back across that subject. So it works really well for those unexpected scenarios. Now, third core concept that I want you guys to understand is following focus, in which I'll actually try to follow the focus of the bird as it's moving in and out. So let's say that there's an owl that's sweeping back and forth or something like that, maybe a raptor that's sweeping back and forth. A great example would be maybe Northern Harrier. Harriers circle and move constantly around fields. They're constantly going up and down in your focus range. So in those scenarios, I'll be trying to follow it um, by just moving back and forth with my focus, uh, my focus wheel. Here, I'll just be moving back and forth and following it and taking a bunch of photos during those times. So that's what I mean by those three concepts. Pre-focusing, pulling focus, and following focus. So an important small little trick that I wanna share with you guys really quick is that when you have still subjects, most cameras have a feature like, for example, with my Panasonic, I'll punch my uh, focus button right here, I'll punch it in, and what that does will punch up to five, six times, four times, three times, depending what I have my setting at. Punch it in, that way I can really tack focus nice and sharp. So with still subjects where you really wanna just get that nice precision manual focus, there's usually a feature on your camera that can do that, so make sure to look for that feature on your camera. I can't necessarily explain it to you guys because every camera system is different, but usually a lot of cameras have that, which is very helpful with still moving subjects. So now let's talk about when to use these techniques. So pre-focusing being one of the easiest ones. Pre-focusing is a great one to use when you have incredibly fast moving subjects or when you have subjects in which you know their behaviors and you know their routines. So a great example of this would be the acorn woodpecker that you guys saw recently. I got an awesome shot of a weight acorn woodpecker in flight and I actually posted it on Instagram as a question if you guys wanted to see a manual focus video on it and that you guys commented probably 10, 15 comments back of like, I'd love to see how this shot was shot in manual focus. And that shot was shot using this technique of pre-focusing in which I knew these two perches that these acorn woodpeckers were flying between. 
And so what I did, I found a really good spot in between those two perches with a beautiful lit background, colorful background, and just waited for the acorn woodpecker to come from the back one to the front one. As he crossed that focus plane, I was able to capture with burst a bunch of photos in that scenario and posted up the best one. So that was an example of pre-focusing using that technique. So pre-focusing is definitely the easiest of all these techniques to use because it just requires you pre-focusing into an area and waiting for it to cross. However, it requires the most understanding of the species that you're going after because it's not something you can typically do on a whim. So for those scenarios where it's really unexpected and out of the blue, that's where I use pulling focus. So even though I use it probably the least because I find myself often more prepared for the species that I'm shooting, it is the one that I use in situations where I'm not ready for that species. So a great example of this was I got an awesome barn owl shot. This barn owl flushed out of nowhere out of the grass at sunrise flying straight towards me. So I had almost no time to react. So all that I did was put my camera up, I pulled focus back, in one direction really quickly and I was able to land about two or three shots in that sequence just pulling focus directly back towards me. So pulling focus while maybe one of the least useful in most scenarios because you usually only land one or two shots of that sequence it's definitely one of the ones that's I guess best to use in spur of the moment because it's the one that's easiest to land still at least those one or two shots. So it's a good safeguard in scenarios like that. Now, lastly, I wanna be talking about following focus and those scenarios that you should be using that in. Following focus is by far the best, but the most difficult. You land way more shots while you're following focus than any other type of these focus forms. However, it's definitely the most difficult. A great example of this would be my sagebrush sparrow video that I released at the beginning of this year. A simple example where the sagebrush sparrow likes to run constantly, run and feed in one area, run and feed in one area, run and feed in one area. And when he's moving around so much, I was having to follow the focus forward, backwards, forward, backwards. So that was a great example of being able to follow and then lock into focus, follow again, lock into focus, pull forward, lock into focus, so on and so forth. Getting sagebrush sparrow was a situation where I was constantly following their focus back and forth. But maybe a more difficult example of this would be my lesser nighthawk video that I released maybe about a month and a half ago in which the lesser nighthawks are just constantly flying in erratic behavior back and forth and back and forth. However, they're slower than swallows. So I was able to focus and follow their focus a lot and land tons and tons of good shots over the course of my experience with them. Got probably like 15, 20 shots that I was really happy with throughout my four week experience with them. And almost all of those were from following focus where I'm just scoping them out in the sky and following them as they're flying through the sky. So it's definitely possible to get great shots this way, but it's definitely the most difficult, takes the most skill to learn over time. So now let's talk about practice. How do I practice these techniques? Because that's very important as well. So in terms of how I practice, there's a four step process in which I would recommend going through in terms of learning manual focus. Obviously it's gonna be a lifelong journey. Like I still constantly get better and better to this day, but 90% of that growth really came in the first two, three months, right? Of practicing th these things through these steps. So one of the ways that I practice this is by memorizing, first of all, step number one, memorizing my camera buttons. Because if you don't know your camera buttons, you're gonna be spending way too much mental energy trying to just function your other buttons to even worry about manual focus. So manual focusing, memorizing obviously the direction of that, but beyond that, being able to memorize the directions of everything else. So what I'll do is I'll either be blindfolded or just close my eyes. So in this scenario, I'll just show you guys by closing my eyes. I'll know where my autofocus versus manual focus button is, know where obviously my shutter is. This is my shutter speed right here. We got aperture control as well. We have my focus punch in right about here, um, being able to move that around, my focus ring, some of those key concepts like that. And obviously there's, there's more buttons than just those to be understood, but just showing you a quick preview. And so memorizing all those buttons and being able to change them on a whim's notice without looking up from your screen will allow you so much more freedom to be able to manual focus well. So that's step number one is memorizing all those buttons and their functions, their positionings. But step number two, is going out and just getting used to manual focus in the first place with an easy, easy subject. So what I recommend for this is something like finding a nest. If you found a good nest and are able to just capture birds in that nest or something like that would be a really easy scenario because they're not going anywhere. So it'll get you kind of used to just the concept of having to hit manual focus yourself rather than having to hit autofocus. And in those scenarios, it's not something that's moving. So it's very easy and you have a ton of time to be able to do it. A great example for me of this is there's an egret and heron roost 
in the town where I live. And so I can go there and I can get birds in those nests, manual focus onto them, and they're not gonna be moving much but just a few inches. So it's gonna be very easy in those scenarios. So that would be step number two that I would recommend, just getting used to the manual focus ring. Now step number three that I would recommend is practicing on waterfowl because waterfowl are unique in that they're not gonna flush so often. I mean, there are waterfowls that are very skittish and are gonna flush on you, but practice on maybe a relatively easier waterfowl, maybe like a, a grebe or an American coot or something like that in which it'll probably let you have a decent amount of time with it. And what they'll be doing is they'll be swimming back and forth. So rather than moving quickly, flying back and forth, or rather than you know, skittish, being skittish and running away, they'll give you a little bit of opportunity to be able to relatively decent speed, be able to catch manual focus with them. So that would be my step number three, is practicing pulling focus and following focus with these ty different types of waterfowls that are decently, um, decently, I guess, not skittish. Now step number four that I would recommend would be practicing with perching birds or birds that fly between perches. And the reason why I say this is because this is a great way to practice pre-focusing where you can plan out, start to understand things and you know perches, which are very specific flight paths that birds are gonna use. And so in those scenarios, you can pre-focus and start learning how to plan out bird behavior or I guess witness bird behavior and plan out your shots accordingly, how to pre-focus in scenarios, stuff like that. If you go through these four steps, you'll learn the concepts at least of all of these ideas. And then from here, you have building blocks to just only grow with these techniques from here on out. So if you get these four down pretty well, you'll be able to take these concepts into further, more detailed and intricate scenarios and be able to utilize them well. So lastly, I just wanted to give you guys a few recommendations before we go. So one of the first recommendations is start with a tripod because using a tripod while you're doing manual focus is gonna be so much easier than not using a tripod. When you use a tripod, it allows you the stability of the tripod to be able to just worry about manual focusing rather than trying to hold up the camera with your left hand and manual focus. So having it on a tripod allows it to just rest there and all you have to do is worry about that manual focus ring. If you can't use a tripod, or maybe it's just not practical to use a tripod in that scenario, what I would recommend is having a place to rest your elbows. So whether that's laying prone on the ground, that way your elbows are rested, whether that's crouched with your knee up, that way you have your left elbow rested, something like that to be able to take the weight off of your left hand is very useful as you're starting out. So that's one helpful tip at the beginning. Now, a second helpful recommendation that I would make is taking the weight off your back. You'd be surprised by how much a backpack on your back affects your ability to be able to manual focus because it makes you so much more shaky. For some reason, I'm not quite sure why that is, but putting that weight on your shoulder always makes me feel like my hands are more shaky if I'm going handheld. And so taking that weight off your back will allow you a lot more minute, fine control over that manual focus ring. So that would be a second thing that I recommend. And lastly, the thing that I would recommend is allow yourself a little bit of grace. For me, I felt like it took me about two months to get good at manual focusing, practicing it consistently. So it's not something that you're expected to learn overnight. And I hope that you guys give yourself a little bit of grace in that scenario because it takes often people about two to three months to feel like they're at a good spot in which they can hit a lot more manual focus than they can autofocus. So in my last workshop video, I got a ton of submissions from you guys for that free two weeks of my wildlife photography mentorship program. So I wanted to do one more round of giveaways actually to be able to allow more people to kind of experience that. And I have a little bit of extra time on my hands. So I'm hoping just to help some people out in that type of way. So what I wanna do is open that back up for you guys. So if you guys press the like button and send me a screenshot or a photo of that to either my email at jeremy.nipe at gmail.com or my Instagram, at Jeremy Knipe. I'll include those in the description below. You guys can be entered for a free two weeks of my wildlife photography mentorship as well. And this time I'll be giving away not only one, but two of those. So um, make sure you enter that if you guys are interested and I'd love to talk with you guys more about it. So hope you guys enjoyed today's video. This is by far the most requested topic, probably gotten 40, 50 direct messages, comments about asking for advice on this area recently or for a video on it. So I'm super happy to share that with you guys today. Hope it was helpful for you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe below if you haven't already. And I can't wait to see you guys in the next video.